Um, so hi everybody, today is Tuesday, August 19, uh, 2014. My name is Jennifer Madrill and I'm here in Chicago, Illinois, and I'm very happy to have with me three guests from Penn State University, and we also have Jill Stefaniak, um, who is a faculty member at Old Dominion University. Jill and I work together on Designers for Learning, facilitating a service learning project coming up in the fall. And before I let my guests introduce themselves, we have some pretty exciting news. We're six days mm -hmm. old as a nonprofit. Um, Jason Ingerman, yay! Jill yay. <laughs> and Jason and uh, Jill, myself, and Monica Tracy are directors of the now newly created, newly formed nonprofit organization. Designers for Learning, and so we um, have everything done except, and it's a big except, our federal tax exempt filing, and that's going to be a big thing to uh, to tackle. But that's our big news, and I just want to make sure I got that out there because it's the first time we've had a chance to announce it formally. Um, but with that, let's just go around the the horn a little bit here, and maybe we can go like Simon and and Roy, and then and Jason and Jill, if you guys wouldn't mind just saying who you are and uh, and where you're working, and and move on to the next person. Sure. This is Simon Hooper. Um, I am on the faculty at Penn State in the Learning Design and Technology program. Okay, you know what, Simon? For me, you were a little quiet. Could folks hear Simon? He was a little quiet for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Simon, I think you, if you want to crank up your audio, that'd be great. Okay, go ahead, Roy. Uh, hi, this is Roy, Roy Clariana. I work with Simon in the Learning Design and Technology program at Penn State and of course also with Jason Ingerman. Yeah, my name is Jason Ingerman. I'm a, a LDT student at um, Penn State University. I'm Jill Stefaniak. I'm an assistant professor in the Instructional Design and Technology program at Old Dominion University. Excellent, excellent. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we met Simon, uh, Jill and I were down at a conference, a research symposium down in Jacksonville, Florida in July. And I had the opportunity to, to do a little breakout session with Simon and he started to tell me a little bit about some of the studio experiences that um, are set up for their instructional design uh, students at Penn State. And so again, that really prompted my um, my desire to have an extended conversation in the webcast. And so I'm not sure, Simon, if you're, <laughs> we had a hard time hearing you. It was a little bit quiet, but did you want to test your audio again and, and give us a, a sense of this studio experience that, um, I, I don't know if this is a capstone that you do with your students or if this is something that's just part of the regular um, instructional design coursework. Would you mind uh, giving us a little overview of that? Sure. First of all, can you hear me better now? I can. Can everybody hear him better? I, yes. I definitely can. Great. Thank you. Go ahead, Simon. So um, I teach Learning Design Studio. Um, it is a required course for our master students, and it is an elective for PhD students. And um, the course came about because we were finding that our students knew an awful lot about theory, but they didn't know so much about practice. They didn't know, and by practice what I mean is um, they weren't so good at actually making things. So the idea of Design Studio is to create an environment where students can learn how to make things and at the same time they can learn about design thinking and they can engage in design activity. Um, so what we have is a course that is really four different courses um, combined into one. Or you can think of it as being four different courses, or you can think of it as being four different levels of a single course. So um, typically what happens in, at a university in an area of interest is that a person goes in and they take a sequence of courses. Um, and those courses are discrete and the idea is that um, they are each course is um, prerequisite to the subsequent course okay well in learning design studio what happens is that students come in and they they start working on a level and then they move on to a higher level of very similar content um, and um, I don't do very much teaching in 
learning design studio. I don't do uh, I don't do traditional didactic teaching. So instead of um, presenting the content to students and having them master that content, what I do is I didn't I. I identify outcomes that I want people to achieve and then I identify resources where people can essentially go and teach themselves and those resources come in different forms sometimes they are um, video tutorials from something like lynda.com sometimes mm -hmm. they're video tutorials that I make and they come in lots of different forms they may come in books uh, or using the host of um, materials that are available over the web. But I tell people what it is I want them to be able to produce. I say here are some resources where you can go and learn about it. Um, now go and work either with people who are working at, at, uh, at the same level that you're working at or if you get stuck you can work with um, students who have already done the content who are at a higher level or, or ultimately if you get stuck you can come and see me and we'll figure out a way to do it. And the idea is that uh, people start working on uh, fairly rudimentary content um, and they progress to doing an individual project for a full semester on their own. Okay. And if people already have the prerequisite content, then they can move to a higher level. And I think we talked about this a little bit in, in July. So these projects are not necessarily with a real client, they're real projects, but they aren't necessarily. Um, with a, um, a client who's, who's asked you to do some specific instructional design work, is that correct? Right. So it certainly can be, but I don't require it. So okay. if a student decides, decides that they want to work on a project that is very personal to themselves, perhaps they're working with an organization, perhaps they've got um, a project of creating something for their family, or for their business, um, uh, I say that's absolutely fine. You go ahead and do it. What I want is people who are excited um, about the projects that they're working on. So that's, that's um, it's more important to me that students should come in and be really excited about the projects that they're going to work on than um, necessarily working on a learning design project. Right. And um, so this immediately, we've had this conversation with a lot of faculty over the past 18 months or so that we've had these designers for learning webcasts. And I've talked to a lot of folks about how they run studio experiences such as this. And we always kind of immediately gravitate to the conversation about your role as facilitator. And I describe it sometimes like herding cats because you've got everybody kind of going off in their own direction and you're the one trying to you know, make sure that uh, they're, they're achieving the the major outcomes that you're hoping they will get by the end of their program it sounds like because you're as you're saying yours builds on each other so you don't want them you know, you know writing songs or whatever something that may not be applicable to uh, to the design of instruction or, or may or may not be but how do you manage that process um, as the facilitator of this do you have certain checkpoints where you have folks check in with you to make sure that you can see how they're doing or how do you how do you do that it varies. At, um, at the lower levels, it's um, much more clear, clearly defined than it is at the higher levels. So at the lower levels, what I have is a series of modules in a fairly broad array of content areas. And um, so you can think about this as being a um, maybe a smorgasbord. Um, and at the beginning of the semester, what I tell people is that they have to complete a certain number of modules where there is um, there are credits that are associated with each module, and the total number of credits that they have to um, complete must equal some given number. Um, so let's pretend that I say they have to complete 10 credits. They might do three on graphic design, four in databases, um, two in video, etc. And um, um, I have one required unit for everybody right at the beginning where people have to do something to create a, um, uh, a module in 
Oh, I can't even remember what it's called right now. <laughs> yes, yeah, it, that's okay. The semester hasn't started yet. <laughs> That'll come that next week. But after that, they get to choose what they want. And then I also say to them, if the module doesn't exist that you want to w work on, um, you can check with me that it's an appropriate module. But you can go and you can go and uh, design your own module with the understanding that at the end of completing that module that you will put together essentially a syllabus that then can be added to the course for another module. So for example, I've got a Photoshop module that is fairly extensive. Well, I had somebody come in uh, last semester who said that he knew Photoshop very well, um, but he still wanted to do a lot more in terms of graphics and what he really wanted to do was to learn Illustrator. So okay. he took the Illustrator module and as he was going through, he documented the process that he went through to, uh, to learn it and um, then turned that documentation into a module. So now we've got an Illustrator module um, and um, so it continues to grow. So we've got um, a new one on the flipped classroom um, that's uh, going into uh, Design Studio for this semester. And so the content can continually evolve. So then that's kind of a pay it forward then for those that come after and say, now I want to learn how to use Illustrator. I would have access to these materials then that he created as part of his project. But then is that, um, is that then something that becomes instructional material for me if I wanted to learn it? Is it that's right. Yep. Is that that's, the idea? That's exactly right, yeah. Wow, so this this is that this is a big deal, <laughs> and so I would I would imagine you're saying this is a lot harder work than if you stood up in front of the class and did a traditional like let's all learn Photoshop this week. I, I'm assuming. Oh, it's so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but, but but to your point, as you said at the beginning, I think all of us have done this for any length of time, and I'm certainly have, I have not done it nearly as long as others as far as trying to teach others the, the craft of instructional design. There's just something missing in the way we've been doing it, having that, not having those opportunities to work on real projects, which really has motivated um, Jill and Jason and Monica and myself to, to dive into the service learning piece because we're tr very much trying to talk to folks like you to, to be able to replicate some of the success, successful strategies you've, you've been implementing. Sure, well, in, in general, what I find is that s students come in desperately wanting to learn. Um, uh, I, I mean, in graduate school, it's not an issue where uh, you have students who are trying to, to do as little work as possible to get by. Their goal is to learn everything in as short a period of time as possible. Um, and one of the problems is that we, especially when it comes to technology, is we, we often try to dictate what we think is most important. And that may or may not work. Um, often there are there are other things that people want to learn. So um, um, I find, for example, I mean the classic example is if, if I've got K-12 people in one of my classes and I'm saying, well, as a multimedia designer, you really need to know something about databases. And they say to me, well, you know, I really don't use databases in my teaching. Um, but there are all sorts of other things that I want to do in my teaching that involve using technology. So I say, well, let's go figure out what those things are uh, and let's learn them. Right. Um, I'm not sure if it's just gone quiet or if I was supposed to say something else. <laughs> I'm in oh, actually, I'm losing everything at the moment. Can, that, no, can everybody hear me now? Yes, yeah, something went wrong. I can hear you oh, now. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, we're having a thunderstorm. Just went, just started. Perfect timing when we started. So I apologize for that. I think I think that's that's my issue here. Um, I just wanted to take a second and um, and also loop Roy into the conversation. Uh, first of all, to thank him, he was a, a pioneering faculty member with our first pilot project, and I think Ensling um, Park is in here as well. Uh, it was his student that he sponsored and I think they're going to come back again for the fall so I really want to thank both of them um, for for participating and then also joining us in, in the call today so uh, Roy I just wondered if you could give me a little sense we haven't had a, a chance to talk about your motivations for including your students in designers for learning but maybe we could start there and, and just give give me a sense for what, what what sounded interesting or intriguing about 
um, ha uh, sponsoring a student to participate with us this spring when we did the pilot. Well, Insung Park uh, came to me with the idea, so uh, she found it on her own, and I don't know exactly where or how, but it intrigued me because of both the combination of service learning and instructional design. Uh, service learning is um, a big thing in Pennsylvania, maybe nationwide, I don't know, but uh, teachers, um, uh, I'm sorry, students in the P uh, Pennsylvania schools are, are required for graduation to do some form of service learning. And so I thought, wow, well, that's, you know, it's starting to become inculcated into our culture. And that's a good thing. I mean, I've always believed in service learning, but not as a professional thing that has an organization or anything. It's just something you do. Uh, so this is sort of a different level. And then uh, tying the instructional design in, that, that makes a whole lot of sense. I've also worked with uh, at-risk students with GED back when I used to work for um, YCAT Systems. They had a, um, a GED standalone computer-based instruction program, sort of like Play-Doh, but, but different, uh, the old Play-Doh system, but it, it was different. It was a YCAT system, and it was very effective. Students could go through all of the modules, and at the end, they could pass a GED. So I thought, well, you know, this, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's a very cost-effective way to do it if you can get someone to pay for the instructional design and development of the tool. So here's a way of trying to get volunteers to create these materials. And I don't know a whole lot about it. The, the commitment of time on my part hasn't been very high other than certifying and sewing and then following up afterwards. So I'm hoping she's doing a good job and she's asked yeah. to join again this time. So, so that's good. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're thrilled to have her on board again. It, definitely. Yeah. yeah, I haven't asked her if it's uh, print based materials or are you trying to do some sort of uh, flipping the classroom, you know, with the videos like, uh, uh, God, I can't think of the, like the Khan like Academy, Khan Academy or, yeah. or, yeah, or what sort of approach is, uh, you know, uh, is being used and how it complements other existing uh, potentially free GED programs or is it simply completely separate? I mean, uh, so there's all sorts of issues there that are kind of interesting. And, the, and you know what? This is a perfect segue for why I, I, I'm hoping I'm hoping that we'll have some answers that we can collaborate on in the future. Because let me just give you a, just a slight bit of background on on our project and our client. We are working with a specific client, Grace Centers of Hope. They're in Pontiac, Michigan, and they have um, um, an outreach to homeless um, and um, either uh, addicted through to, uh, drugs or alcohol, um, and, and, and for the most part, homeless folks that are on-site residential clients of theirs, and if they have not passed the GED in the past or finished high school, um, they take the, the courses within their education program as a means to progress uh, toward being able to take the exam. And our client w was doing a great job. They were getting about 18 folks through the GED every year, chugging away, and then all of a sudden the GED changed, the, the format changed. And that was in two, early 2014. And so they were looking for ways to, um, as you say, most of the time you have to pay for materials or you know, find some, some way to get them. And so we thought this was a great collaboration to have the students um, help out. And so now to get to the, the crux of your questions, we very much are still on the stage of we don't know what we're going to be when we grow up. Right now what we're doing is trying to be platform agnostic. And so we are, it, it, everything we're creating right now is fairly, and I'll use the term generic looking. So we're using kind of basic PowerPoint templates where it's screen by screen. So if one day we have the opportunity through a grant or through collaborations um, with other folks to be able to take it to the next level and to be, have, a, have a more robust way to deliver the content, that would be great. Um, but we also have constraints such as obviously the 15 week time commitment. All of our students pretty much are, are you know, using this as I would say about half the students are using it as some type of um, either internship or practicum or, or some experience for our class. So we do need to get them a project that's discreet enough that they can start it and finish it. So long-winded answer to your question, what we're creating right now is really not what we're hoping ultimately we will be. We hope these are the prototypes and the exemplars that will one day be hosted in some other fashion to be determined. Um, and so we're kind of in the stage right now of talking to folks like you. Um, as I mentioned, we, we moved to a nonprofit strategy, so hopefully that opens doors to grants to be able to get some money to try to get things, thing, these things um, pushed forward. And I don't want to in any way belittle what the students are doing because in the first semester we had um, three groups 
um, that designed instructional materials that, um, and in fact, Jill, do you want to take a second, Jill, and um, describe what your students did this past semester in, in reviewing things? Uh, sure. Um, this past summer, I taught on uh, designing online instruction. And so while we were talking about, you know, learning theory and different instructional strategies and what might drive, you know, interaction within an online learning environment, um, I had my students review um, some of the modules that Jennifer had provided us so that they could kind of critique them and see, you know, what, what, what were examples of, of good strategies that were being used for an online environment and where were there some opportunities where we could improve upon things. Um, the students were also tasked with the fact that we, we told them up front that there's a lot of constraints in the sense that we don't have the resources available to be doing a lot of high-tech things because our client isn't going to be able to replicate that or be able to provide that to their clients. And so um, the students kind of had to juggle that um, with the ba balancing that. How much interaction can we incorporate, you know, within the confines of the project? And so it was, it gave them an opportunity to kind of see real instruction um, and kind of base it off of, you know, different readings and discussions that we'd been having, you know, throughout the summer um, just to kind of see how everything kind of tends to pair up. And so the cool part of this, so now Jill's students, we've had a lot of this kind of pay it forward stuff where one group will start something and then they'll use it for like her students this summer used it for an experience in their class. And now, so now we've got the artifacts of their, uh, their evaluation of the students work. And so we're going to have a, a group of students in our fall semester now take it to the next level. So take the, the artifacts, the, the instructional materials that were created and then take it to, to the next level. Um, but as I said, right now, it's, I'm, I get so excited hearing what Simon's doing with his studio work because we, we got purposely our style guide for the students that we've created for the fall, it is very basic. I mean, we're asking them to use Arial font, <laughs> we're saying, you know, uh, white background, black text, and again, this whole idea that we want down the road or whatever style we end, we, it, what was becoming a problem is when we had each group kind of defining their own style guides. And so we decided, let's just take it all back to about as simple as you can get. So if down the road, um, then we're able to, uh, to take it from one, everybody's got a kind of a common base, we'll take it to the next level. So, um, but in uh, Jennifer. Next, yeah, please go ahead, Roy. Quick, quick, a quick aside on that. Um, if, while they're designing, if they uh, go ahead and incorporate um, the levels of headings and normal text, uh, if everybody standardizes that, then it'll make it uh, uh, more easily readable by JAWS or any of the um, screen read uh, uh, tools that um, <clears throat> for, for accessibility purposes for, for the, the blind or hard of hearing for being able to listen to the, uh, the materials. You know, you bring up some really good points, and, and Jill and I've talked about this briefly. Um, we have hardly even contemplated accessibility, and Brett, um, Brett Cook's on the line here. I don't know if he has the ability to talk to us as well, but um, he's very interested in, in issues of accessibility, um, and it's, it's just an area that we really haven't even been able to tackle yet. Oh. And so I think what you're saying, it sounds like if we keep things fairly simple, that will make things easier down the road. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, it's a, it's a very simple thing to do, but it's, it's very powerful that you literally go ahead and use Microsoft's uh, levels of headings and the, where it says normal text and different levels of headings. If everybody does that, then the screen readers can handle it. And also, if you're, of course, using any images, uh, that's a whole separate issue, but if you're using images, you need to describe them in text so that they they're readable. Uh, but but just that levels of headings makes a gigantic difference for the screen readers. Okay, that's excellent. Um, and then in our last twenty minutes or so, or however much time we have before um, uh, b before we're done, I would just love to start contemplating ways, if possible, that we could collaborate on things, or if Simon, if your students are in need of ideas for projects that we could somehow have them work on things. And I'm just gonna throw a few things out there that are, are things that we'd like to explore. And you know, just, we're, it's just Jill and I right now facilitating, so we're kind of limited to, uh, you know, to how much we can actually you know, put pile on our plates. But we've talked a little bit with Jason about badges. Um, I think this type of uh, GED prep could lend itself well to badges. So as people progress through the various levels, say in math or in English uh, language arts, um, it may be a, an opportunity for us to figure out some way to align assessments with badges. Um, certainly, as we're talking about, we'd love to take things to the next level as far as how we host these, these materials, how we present them. 
So from the things we've talked about so far between Roy and Simon or Jill or Jason, is there any, anything where you can start seeing some possible ways we could collaborate or uh, start brainstorming on things that we could um, somehow interface our, our efforts here? Okay, this is Simon. Uh, so from my perspective, um, um, it's, it's difficult to know um, just how this will move forward because it's so idiosyncratic for each of the students. However, if, they ha if you are able to give us a description of what it is that you guys do and the types of projects that you have access to, um, that is something that could be integrated within Design Studio uh, to let people know um, that this exists as a way of finding authentic projects that they can work on. Okay. So do, do you, um, and I, we barely had a talk, chance to talk about this in July, but I know the word badge kind of went through the air at some point and I don't remember the context. Is that something that you're working on either in the studio experience or something outside of that? It, it's integrated within the studio experience. So we have something called Penn State badges, which is part of, part of the Mozilla system. And what we're doing is we are adding badges to each of the, um, uh, each of the modules within Design Studio will have a badge that goes along with it. And uh, all of the outcomes um, associated with that badge will be um, listed on the site. And then people can earn the badge and then add that to their uh, personal web pages or wherever they want, want to put them. So oh, is it, I um, played around a little bit with the Mozilla um, Open Badges, and I think it's now, there's also Kind of a spin-off of that as well and so to, for us to be able to access the Penn State badging how do, that you need to be able to align somehow with someone at Penn State right I can't just go and start using that now right well I'm just about to find out how it's going to be used because I've had somebody developing the badge part of, of the site for me over the summer so I'm not in a good position to talk about it right now I will be by the end of the semester um, but, uh, so yeah, I can't really give you any detailed information about how that's going to work. Okay. Well, well you know, I've got you in my notes. So <laughs> I don't forget these things, so we'll keep uh, Yeah. Keep I, I can't give you exact information on that, but we did speak about that, right? Currently, you just need a username and password. It's open. The, the problem is that the badges are hosted within the L3 platform. So they're not, you, you can't export them at the moment. You can't send them anywhere. So the way that you access them is, is through L3. Um, but they're working on that, though. They're working on being able to export them. Uh, it's something that's down the pipe. I should ask Jason while you're on, did you take the studio course with Simon? Or this yes, yes, course? I did. It was quite the experience. Um, it, it is definitely a different brand or a different style of learning, which is great. It, it breaks from the traditional way that you would learn, but it's definitely more authentic. And actually, I'll be bringing in a project in the spring that I'm very excited about um, doing there in that course. Uh, but it, it's definitely a fun, it's a fun course. I've also taken the instructional system, the intro to instructional systems with, with Roy as well, which also lays down the basics of instructional design. That, and those two are pretty much the courses that we, we actually get that practical and authentic experience. Um, and one of the reasons why I've, you know, joined up with DFL to try to spread this gospel a little bit more. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, we're so excited to see it. And Jill, I see your hand, or you raised your flag. Did you want to say something, or is that just you're hitting the button? <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. Nope, she put it down, I guess not. I didn't realize my flag was up. <laughs> <laughs> Jill, I wonder if you could um, take a couple minutes and describe for folks what our thoughts are on, now we're running the, the fall semester as a cognitive apprenticeship. And as long as we've got uh, Roy and Simon on the phone, I wondered if we could run through it and maybe they could give us some suggestions on things that we could, could think about. Do you want to just kind of give them a, a, a sense of why we picked that as our framework and then what are some of the things we're thinking about? Sure. Um, well, one of the challenges that we noticed um, with the first round, um, the first round of projects that we did with Designers for Learning last semester was that we had students that were scattered all over the country and they're all coming in from very different instructional design programs and so depending on the the number of courses that they had taken or depending on who the faculty were that were teaching some of the more foundational courses 
students were coming in either speaking uh, using different um, using different vocabulary, different terminology. We started noticing when we started communicating different processes or what we thought were different instructional design uh, processes, people didn't always know what we were talking about or they had a different name for it. Um, one way that we thought to kind of um, have some consistency for the next round of projects this fall is that uh, Jennifer and I are putting together a cognitive apprenticeship um, for that semester. So not only because this is a service learning project and it's supposed to be a learning experience as well for the students, as well as, you know, providing services to our client Grace Centers for Hope, um, what we're planning on doing is we're going to kind of do what we're calling like our startup boot camp. I don't think we're going to call it a boot camp to the students. We don't want to scare them off, but just kind of go over what some of the, the terms that are going to be, the terminology, the vocabulary that we're going to be using um, for designers for learning as we're communicating. And we'll kind of go over to and say, you know, we're calling it this. You might call it, you know, something else. Um, but we're also going to be having the students um, engaging in Reflective practice. Reflection is a big piece um, of, of a cognitive apprenticeship and being able to reflect on the various stages. And Jennifer are and I are planning on providing them with feedback. Um, one of the challenges um, in working on this project is that we're working with a vulnerable population. And I think oftentimes when we teach our graduate students how to create an instructional design project from scratch, it's usually in those introductory courses. And we typically tend to let them pick their ideal audience. And they're not necessarily going to have people that are going to be encountering challenges or, you know, or you get to learn, you know, all of your learners are going to be, you know, stellar and they're all going to, you know, want to be taking your course. And so I think when it's really hard when some of these students who haven't been exposed to, you know, designing instruction for different uh, populations, when we have them designing instruction for a vulnerable population, and then we have limited resources at hand, that can pose several challenges. And so we really want to make sure we're going in depth in um, providing them, you know, with that what that learner audience um, really looks like, um, what what they're hoping to get out of this, what do they need to get out of this, um, what are the goals and the objectives of the program, and so. Um, some of the activities for the Cognitive Apprenticeship is trying to build that community of practice um, throughout the semester. So we're going to be having um, points in, in time during this project where we're going to be posing discussion questions, um, not so much like a graduate um, course where you would have, you know, weekly assignments and questions, but just kind of making sure that the students are, you know, communicating with one another as they're going to be going off and designing different modules. It's all for the same audience, and there's going to probably be a, lot of, a little bit of overlap in how they can complement one another. And so we're trying to build that in so that if a student's encountering a challenge with a particular part of their of their um, online learning module, um, somebody else might have encountered that challenge too and can offer some insight as to what they did to correct it. Um, and so we're trying to do this where we're providing more feedback, um, there's more scaffolding more scaffolding in place um, so that we can we can help them move forward with the project and, and deliver a good product to our clients. Yeah and I speaking of clients I I'm sorry, Kim, I missed Kim. Kim Phillip is here. She's our client from Grace Centers of Hope. So hi, Kim. She just uh, put in the text chat. She thanked um, folks. She has been an awesome pioneering first client for us to have. Very, very patient with us as we learn. And she loves to fire up new technology and work with us. And um, tying into what Jill was saying, and then also a question that Barb Hall posted in the text chat. Um, she was asking if the RID students conduct a learner analysis as part of the project or if the information is pri um, provided. This was a little bit unique. Um, probably, I think, ideally going forward, I think that would be a great aspect for the students to take on. Um, but I did have a fair amount of time up front working with Kim Phillip, Courtney, and then also um, Bonnie Shelnut, who is their um, instructional design volunteer who works with them. She's a retired instructional designer. And so we did a lot of that up front in terms of understanding what the learners were. But to, to get to Jill's point, it's one thing for us to provide them with a description of it. We've even had in the last semester some of the faculty that were part of the um, spring project help create personas just to get, again, get pe folks in the mindset of who the learners are. But I think um, your point is very well taken, Barb. I think this is the point you're trying to make, and certainly the point that Jill made is that um, this is just a different population than most of our students are probably used to designing for. And um, so we're trying to incorporate more of that in, in terms of the reflections they're doing than necessarily being able to do comprehensive, what we would consider to be a, a traditional learner analysis. But certainly going forward, as we take on different clients, um, ideally, I, I or the facilitator that would be running the project would back away a little bit more from those initial scoping the project and, and providing the, the learners or the um, service learners 
with descriptions of the learners. We'd rather have them go out and seek the information themselves and find out what they need to know. Um, Jill, did you have any other comments on, on Barb's question as far as ways that we could incorporate that, a learner analysis, uh, more, more of a traditional learner analysis than what we're doing? Um, I know just because of the, the numbers of students, um, we're not going to have them actually go out and conduct one themselves. Um, I know we've conducted one in the past, and we're just going to make sure perhaps that I think what we're planning on doing right now is having like a recorded webinar with the students where we really kind of go through what that learner analysis looks like in more detail and answering questions. I, I think in the past it, it was presented to them or the information was presented to them, but I don't know how much time was actually spent really focusing in on vulnerable populations and how this might um, impl implicate our, our, you know, instructional design. And so I think we're going to spend just a little bit more time on that just so that it's more, you know, clearly communicated and that it's emphasized at the beginning of the project. Yeah. And that's a, that's a question I guess I'd, I'd have for you too, Simon, um, as you're saying everybody's coming to the experience for your studio with projects that they are interested in. Um, are there certain things that they, you ask them to in include as part of it, kind of what Jill was saying, um, when we, we asked the students last semester, I think we even called it a design plan because <laughs> we needed something to be able, it was just, I had no idea what they were trying to do unless they told it to me somehow. And so I called it a design plan. Some people call it a design uh, document. Some people call it a design vision, I, you know, whatever. But, um, and then usually there's some type of analysis that happens pretty early on. So do you, do you have the students going through any type of process that you recommend or how, how do you kind of guide them through these kind of more traditional tasks that tend to happen in instructional design but yet you're now more on a project-based course how, how do you handle those types of things yeah well th this happens in two types of situations either if someone wants to deviate from the prescribed course um, of a level um, i'll get them to um, come up with a document where they describe what it is that they're going to do um, and the outcomes that they're going to achieve. Uh, and then in level four, everybody has a, um, uh, when you're going through level four, you have to prepare a design document in which there are certain uh, parts of the project that have to be described in some detail. And um, again, um, a, a pretty good description of what it is that the, the person is going to, going to actually be making is going to be described in that document. And then at the end, they have to go through a brief formative evaluation process with um, two or three members of the target audience to get some feedback uh, on, uh, on usability and the extent to which they've achieved their outcomes. Yeah, you you maybe see me nodding my head. I don't know if you can see me, but these are all things that it's really funny, Jill. It, it really is comical. Jill and I have had so many discussions with folks about what to call this thing that you just talked about—a design vision. You know, some people think design document has such baggage attached to it that you know there's such history with it. Then they want to change different words, and um, and then as you're saying, what we, we noticed, and Kim is on the um, on the call. She can I'm so sure vouch for this, but. We were not able last time, due to timing constraints, and we only had 11 weeks, we did not have that layer of um, usability testing. We did have some type of an abridged expert review where we had the faculty stepping in as kind of um, expert instructional designers critiquing the students' work. But that piece to me, I think, is really crucial, is to be able to see how the students actually, um, you know, I say students, I mean uh, the learners at Grace Centers of Hope, how they actually interact with our content. And so that's something we're, um, we're definitely layering in on this new, um, on this new round. Um, well, I, I'm basically running out of uh, questions for you, for you folks. Did, is there anything um, that you wanted to share about your programs or something interesting or new that you're doing that you'd love to, you know, to share with us as you head into the new semester? Either Roy or Simon or Jason or Jill or anybody? For me, it's the badging part. I'm really uh, excited about how that's going to work. Uh, I haven't done it before, and um, so that, that, that's new ground for me. Please keep us looped in the loop, because <laughs> really, that's something we will either incorporate within this project or something down the road. Um, I think it, it makes a lot of sense. 
Well, as a bigger picture, imagine um, imagine that you break the content down into learning objects that have set up information and uh, practice in some form of feedback or assessment so that it can stand alone as a chunk that they could do in some reasonable amount of time, say 20 minutes. It's real easy to tie perhaps a badge to that or put three or four of those together and make that a badge. So there is a certain feeling of um, completion. You know, if you're standing in front of a chemistry textbook that's 800 pages long and you've got to learn that, I guess you can feel like, well, we're halfway through or whatever, but with the badges, it's sort of like checked off. You know, you can't take that away from me. And so from an instructional design viewpoint, the old-fashioned instructional design, that's a good thing because you've taken content, you've structured it, you've added things that, that make it work, like practice and feedback, and you're adding that sense of accomplishment, which is motivational for these learners. And some of them are likely to have to drop out uh, for periods of time and then come back, there probably are requirements or contractual requirements that you say, well, you've got to come every Monday or something, and they agree. But whatever, you know, something's going to happen. It, you know, they're going to, their car's going to break down. They don't have a car. Something's going to happen. They can't make it. So here's something that remains there, and they can come back and pick up where they left off. So you can see how instructional design ties into badges and how it ties into your particular audience. It ties into any audience, of course, but it, it ties into particularly to an audience that might have problems with continual access because of life circumstances. Absolutely. And Kim is here and I'm speaking for her. I, I hope I'm speaking correctly, but uh, tying into what you're saying, Roy, they ha basically have individual education plans for each student, it's like an IEP. Um, it's fairly informal and it's because it's a smaller group that they have um, going through the program at any one time, a dozen or so students. So it's a little bit um, less formal than a true plan, but they definitely know where students are and, and they very much, Kim has, I think, agreed that this is what they consider their organization to be. And I've heard others who, who teach um, um, in this type of setup, they call it like a one room schoolhouse. And so you've got everybody coming in with all kinds of different levels. And so these that again tying into what you're saying Roy with the badges that would help to then know where folks are are at any one uh, point in time um, and then as I said you may have somebody at a fifth grade level another at an eighth grade level or whatever it may be or it may equate to that on um, uh, on the k-12 scale and uh, right now I think that's kind of hard to be able to to match where folks are well, also the, the idea that the GED is sort of wipes the slate clean and it's starting over, it sort of puts you in an interesting position. Um, in terms of being at a forefront, then you could think rather than just Pontiac, Michigan, you could think there are, what, a million or at least 500,000, I don't know how many, what the numbers are, people who would be interested in a program like this. So if you, t if you tie it together, so that you come and do you you do some sort of a entry test or some sort of a, a review of existing uh, stuff that people have already finished that puts them at a certain level you know the testing and what they've done they start there and start working to go towards taking that GED test uh, it becomes national it, it, it's a larger audience than than just that one audience and that's the that's the deal with badges if badges are going to work the way that uh, the people who support them imagine it's not just a check box for a learning object it's something that has national or international regional and national or international recognition in other words if I have a badge on uh, MOOCs and it's given by Microsoft or Centaur or somebody, that means something. Other people know what that means. And so uh, if, so, so you get what I'm saying is that the concept of badge has to do with your reputation. And so if you build a national reputation, reputation on your GED. Your badges also get a national reputation. All of that goes together. It's not just instructional design where we're delivering modules and people are learning. There's a sort of a marketing piece. There is a social design or, or uh, I don't know if it's community, but there is a, a learning environment design issue here that's bigger, that's at the cultural uh, uh, or society level, that they all enter uh, act with each other so that then like like now I was looking on the web the other day and I, I don't even remember what I was looking up but uh, I think it was an app to do a particular thing well I looked and there were probably 40 apps but there were two or three at the top 
and somehow or another they floated to the top either because they were first or because they were best or because more people liked them or something so it's sort of like that with yours is that the vision you could have for drawing money to make this go bigger is a vision like that that it's yeah we're going to start in pontiac and we're going to do it in this volunteer fashion but there's a bigger vision here there are a lot of people that can be helped by this core effort that can then expand so focus on a chunk and make it perfect and then let that be a template for doing the others i'm just throwing out ideas for you guys to think about though these are the ideas we love <laughs> thank yeah, you and, i really um, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I really appreciate that because as I was working through building the badges, because I went through the L3 system and I, I started creating badges for the first pilot, I, I started to have some ideas like that. I mean, what's the authentication, authentication of the badge? You know, who's issuing the badge and is it going to be recognized uh, throughout the nation? Obviously, this is a GED and the GED credentials are going to be nationally recognized. So these badges also kind of carry that same weight. The other issue is um, in terms of getting the badges or creating the badges is who, who's going to do the badge, who's creating them, which I just talked about, but also who's receiving the badges. So we had discussed do the learners receive the badge as well as the students that are conducting the instructional design or should, just, should we just be issuing the badges to the learners? So that, that's kind of a discussion that we were having as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's it's applicable on both sides. Uh, right now, we're really we're not an accredited you know in educational institution. So right. so what Jill and I were talking about that um, I think we are going to have a figure out a way to do a badge for the students who uh, complete this a service learning badge. Um, so you participate for your service hours, as Roy was saying, that's such a big part of programs now. Some even to make it a requirement before you graduate, they have to have a certain amount of credit um, hours in service learning related courses. Um, and then also then your your experience as an instructional designer. So whatever aspect of the the design work you've done, you could earn badges um, for for completing those those things as well. And then, as you're saying, the, the the part that Roy was mentioning was then incorporating it as part of what we're doing for the the GED prep. Um, and Roy, you're totally we're we're right with you. I'm in the fall, I'm heading off with so actually one of the students that was um, in the program, uh, Rhonda was, one of the students in the spring, in the fall now, she and I are going to travel to the Open Education Conference in um, DC. And our talk is all about um, using open educational resources for this audience. So we have all these K-12 resources that are already out there. MacArthur Foundation, all those folks have thrown a lot of money at that. Um, being able to take those resources and adapt it for an adult audience and then maybe overlay it with as we're talking about badging or whatever it may be um, to be able to take it to scale a little bit quicker than maybe having the students create every you know resource from scratch um, because we as we found out in the spring semester we had one group of students that were, went out and just mapped and mined all of the um, not all of the but a substantial chunk of open educational resources in the k-12 world and um, I think that would be a great first cut for us to be able to take some of the vetted, well done K-12 resources and figure out ways um, to adapt that um, for an adult audience and then layer in these other pieces we're talking about. So yay, you guys, thank you for the ideas. These are great. Um, anything else before we head out? I really appreciate your time. I know everybody's busy heading in, into the new semester, but is there anything else that anybody wanted to say before we sign off? Uh, if you send Simon uh, the the uh, document he had asked for, I think it was a one or two paragraph description. For all I know, it could be on your website al already. Um, I teach the intro 415 instructional design course, and students are allowed to self-select. And so it's conceivable, um, maybe, that there might be some way of one of them or maybe more than one wanting to be involved with what you're doing or maybe after they take the course they might uh, I, i'm not sure though because 415 has its own structure and milestones and everything and they wouldn't necessarily overlap or align with your next cohort uh, of people that are working so 
I'm not sure if it'll work or not, but anyway, I, I would like to take a look at that, uh, that document too. Sure. We do a website and I can give you a sense of what this project is. Um, we also would have opportunities as Jill did with her class. I don't know if you teach an evaluation class or if evaluation is a component of it, but that's usually a, a kind of a, an easy thing too to, to allow them to take a crack at critiquing some of the materials that are already created, which is, as you're saying, it might align a little easier within within your workflow than having to try to time things. But yeah, that's definitely, that's a great, uh, great opportunity for us to collaborate. So um, let's see, we consider, I think, I think we had all the questions too that were in the chat room. So, well, thank you everybody. I really appreciate the time you took and, and don't forget us. <laughs> we're not going to forget you. We had the conversations about badges and um, have a great week, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.